Thanks, Ikai. So yes, experimentally generated number, random numbers. We have an exciting time right now in, uh, in the field because we have recently our first loophole free Bell test experiments. Um, Baz Henson's experiment, uh, Chris Shalm's experiment, which I was involved in on the statistical analysis side, uh, Marissa Justina, and also Weinfurter gave his talk earlier this week. So this is a good time to be working in the field because, well, we've falsified local realism and now we can get to the fun stuff, quantum information theory, but really, really secure quantum information theory that, uh, you know, really implementing some of these things we've been writing about and thinking about for a long time in a very high level, secure way. So in particular, uh, I work at NIST, um, and one thing we're interested in is random number generation, and part of the reason we're interested in this non-locality experiment is because if you have non-locality in an experiment, and you believe that faster than light signaling is not possible, then you must sort of concede that there's some randomness in your experiment that cannot be predicted. And in particular, we're gonna be studying a model of random to an adversary or eavesdropper or just anybody who has some sort of information about your experiment, uh, classical information at the beginning of the experiment. And this information is not gonna allow the adversary to turn the experiment into a faster than light signaling machine uh, under the condition that settings choices can be generated independently of said adversarial information. So that's our paradigm in which we're going to try to extract randomness from our experiment. So we have a, a classic 2-2-2 two, two, two experiment with two measurement choices at either end. So Alice and Bob are spatially separated by a great distance, a few hundred meters, and they're toggling their measurement settings. So Alice can tilt her little polarizer, and Bob can tilt his polarizer, or they can both tilt it, and they're randomly toggling between these two settings, A and A prime for Alice, B and B prime for Bob. And for every experimental trial, either they see a detector click or they don't. So a binary output. So we get these experimental distributions, and I'm going to be talking about tables like this uh, frequently throughout this remainder of this talk, where each row represents a probability distribution. So for instance, in the second row, A, B prime, this is the probability distribution that we would see when Alice chooses setting A, Bob chooses setting B prime, and I've highlighted in red that 0.0732 for this particular probability distribution, that means that there's a roughly 7% chance that Alice will see a click, denoted by plus, Bob will see nothing, denoted by zero. And so all of these rows are gonna sum up to one, because each one represents a probability distribution. So with this you know, thing I said about the faster than light prohibition implying uh, randomness, we're gonna be looking at these distributions and sort of trying to see where that randomness is. Because you know you could have a local realist distribution for your experiment, let's just say for the sake of argument, half the time you run this, uh, you see clicks on both ends regardless of the setting, and half the time you run it, you see no clicks on either side regardless of the setting. This is a very local distribution. It's very easy to simulate in really a non-random way. I mean, there are these one-halves in the distribution, but there's no real randomness there because you could just say, well, you know, maybe I have some hidden variable explanation. I just know that half the time they're generating some states that always generate a click on the left there on both ends, and half the time you're sending some state that doesn't generate any clicks, or maybe you're not sending a state, and that's why it doesn't generate any clicks. So for this distribution up there, there's no randomness in there. It's, it can be sort of um, further information about the experiment could allow you to remove the randomness from this experiment. Whereas if you look at the PR box, now this is a non-local distribution, and you try to play this same game, you say, well, if this is the experimental distribution I'm looking at, you know, is there some agent out there who understands this better than I do who would know you know, what's gonna happen based on some 
greater knowledge of the experiment. So he doesn't see this as random, even though I do. And if you try to play this game of sort of decomposing the PR box into some deterministic states, you start getting into trouble. So, you know, perhaps on the left you would have this state where it would generate clicks on both ends, um, regardless of setting, unless Alice chooses A prime and Bob chooses B prime, in which case Bob gets no click while Alice still gets a click. And you can see how this would generate problems because if we're on the left side here, then whenever Bob chooses B prime, if he sees a click, he knows that Alice chose setting A. And if he doesn't see a click, he knows that Alice chose A prime because we work over to the left there. And if he, so if he had access to this information that would remove the randomness from the PR box, all of a sudden we've got a machine that can send signals faster than the speed of light between Alice and Bob. So we don't think that that's what's happening. So our only other choice is that if you can't send signals between Alice and Bob, the randomness in the PR box cannot be eliminated. This is true randomness, unpredictable to these agents that cannot signal faster than the speed of light, so long as you can generate your measurement settings independently of this agent's power. So if we had this, uh, you know, we'd all be out of business because the PR box is sort of the perfect paradigm for this and very easy to generate the randomness. It's all right there. We don't have a PR box. We have this. This is uh, real data from our photonic loophole-free experiment back in 2015. We have these raw counts. You'll notice most of the time nothing happens at all. Zero clicks on both sides, but only very rarely we get these... Uh, these click outcomes and we can analyze them and show that there's non-locality. So where's the randomness in a distribution like this? Well, from these raw counts, let's make a uh, distribution. Uh, most of the weight is in that column on the right side. And I say no signaling adjusted because I've removed any sort of statistical noise that might look like signaling but is just a statistical fluke. So if you take this distribution here, turns out it can be induced by, most of the time, local realist distributions. That shouldn't be too surprising because we can see, you know, most of the time you're just getting zero clicks on both ends and that seems pretty local. And only sort of like two one hundred thousandths of the time probability weight on a PR box type distribution. So there's randomness in here, but it's all buried in with this noise. Luckily, over the course of 132 million trials, this still means that there's, you know, we can think of there being 3,700 PR boxes in there. Now, of course, we know that the PR box doesn't actually exist, so this is really just a theoretical tool, but um, for the adversary who's constrained only by the no signaling principle, they might have these PR boxes, but they can't do any better than supplying at least, you know, in the range of a few thousand of them. They can't make this data without having this randomness in the um, distribution through the PR box. So, so for our data, we want to come up with a protocol for extracting this randomness. It needs to be effective in a very low violation regime. In fact, that data I just showed you there has a CHSH parameter of 2.0000564 just barely above the bell bound. And we want a protocol that's robust to possible memory effects and handles finite statistics effects. So if there's any asymptotic bounds, we need to turn those into real uh, finite bounds that we understand and can apply in a, in a fixed length experiment. And so what we found was uh, existing methods are not effective in our regime. So for instance, Peronio's method from the Nature paper 2010, 2011, and then some subsequent work that tidied up their results. You know, we try that and we, we can't get any randomness uh, for any choice of Bell inequality. It's a modular protocol, but for any choice of Bell inequality, we cannot use this to certify randomness uh, unless we were to have trials the number of trials would have to be roughly two orders of magnitude larger than the number of trials we were actually working with here. So, you know, a uh, hundred billion, something like that. So, in order to get some, a new protocol that's effective in our regime, 
you know, we went back and looked at these papers which develop statistical analysis techniques effective for falsifying local realize, realism in low violation photonic experiments. So these were, um, the first paper I wrote ended up being the technique we used to come up with our p-value in the loophole-free test at NIST. Uh, and then the second paper developed some similar techniques used for uh, the uh, Justina experiment in Austria. And then there's a third paper here developing similar techniques. And this actually ended up being the one that was useful to us from which we could build a randomness extraction protocol. So start, starting from this paper that was designed to falsify local realism, uh, we have developed this uh, new method to bound the entropy and built a protocol on it. So the protocol, I'm going to go through all these steps. You start by choosing a Bell function from your experimental outcomes to the positive numbers. Uh, so you want a, so for each particular settings outcome thing that happens, you map that to a, a real number. And those are our real numbers. They're all kind of close to one. Some are bigger and some are smaller. But these particular set of numbers mean that the expected value of this Bell function T is going to be less than or equal to one for any local realist theory. See, that's my little E subscript LRT less than or equal to 1. So for, um, that's for equiprobable settings combinations. But if you were to use a PR box and see what would happen for um, the expected value of T given a PR box, you would get something a little bit bigger than 1. So what happens is with this particular Bell function, you start getting things that are... Um, if, if you start seeing a lot, on average, of things that are bigger than one, you're falsifying LR. That's the idea. So, in an experiment of n trials, now, once you've chosen your function, you compute the product of those numbers, some of which were a little bit bigger than one, some of which were a little bit smaller than one, a few of them were equal to one. And so, after 132 million trials, roughly, we get a, the product of all of those numbers comes out to be uh, 2.76 times 10 to the 9. So we had a lot of those little 1.02s and 1.03s, but when we multiply them all up, we start getting things in the range of billions. <clears throat> so when you get these big numbers, recall that you know, the expected value under LR says they should be 1 or smaller. So if you get these big numbers, these results are going to put a lower bound on the amount of min entropy present in the data. And so this, was really, this is really the key result, is that the min entropy is going to satisfy this bound, which is a function of n, the number of trials, m, which is sort of the PR boxiness parameter of the function you're using to witness the Bell violation. m is the excess over the local realist bound for the function. v is the observed violation. And epsilon sub s is going to be a error parameter. So I guess a smoothness parameter. You have this amount of min entropy up to an error of size epsilon s. And so when you pass the protocol, this is going to be the average min entropy of the output string conditioned on the possible values of the setting string. And so once you've seen that you have this amount of min entropy, you can uh, apply the Trevisan extractor, which we actually do um, on our team. We have some help. People have uh, written some updated software based on Maurer's implementation of the Trevisan extractor. And we have a nice hard bound on this. We can extract up to T epsilon uniform bits, where T obeys the following formula, which is a function of the min entropy and another smoothness parameter introduced by the uh, extractor step. So, so the min entropy theorem introduces some error, and then this introduces some more error, epsilon x, and then the final epsilon uniform thing is the sum of these two errors. So, so as a result, for our data set that we published last year, 2015, we can use this to get, you know, hundreds of bits out uh, certified, and these are extractable bits. This is not min entropy. This is, you know, the actual zeros and ones at the very end of the entire protocol. So, you know, for at about 10 to the minus 6 error 
probability, we're getting about 200, 200, 300 bits extracted from our data. But the really nice thing about this is, you know, we designed this protocol based on the data we had, right? So, I mean, this is sort of a retroactive application to a data set that was um, designed, the protocol was designed to work for this kind of data. So to show that it's not hyper-tailored to this data, we've applied it to some new data sets that uh, have not been analyzed before, also loophole-free, and so we have, we call these blind one and blind two, meaning that, you know, we applied the protocol cold. This was the first analysis step. We didn't know what we were gonna get other than that we built it to be a loophole-free bell test, so we expected it was going to work. And so this is really nice. In fact, one of our, one of our new data sets here gets, is getting up into the 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 error probability. So, I mean, this thing on the, you can see this is a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. So, you know, at uh, sort of a 0.01 significance, we're getting, you know, almost 2,000 or 1,500 bits in that realm. So, so that randomness is in there and we're getting it out and we feel good about it. So in conclusion, you know, here they are. It's, it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember uh, I went to a QCrypt conference, I think about 2011 or 2012, it was in Waterloo and uh, Vadim Makarov gave a talk about, um, you know, hacking quantum experiments. He says, but if it's a loophole free test, you know, even I cannot <laughs> hack this thing. So, uh, so I guess that's the challenge. If, uh, if, if any of you wants to, you know, open an envelope and say, hey, look, I, look, I've got these same bits here and this envelope was dated mid 2015 before you took the experiment, then I'm pretty, uh, pretty convinced that you have the power to s signal faster than the speed of light. So, <laughs> so yes, please get in touch with me, but yeah. All right, so I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. If there are any questions. Uh, yes, so we don't assume independent, identically distributed states, and uh, we, in fact, we allow, the way we model it, it's possible that the state of the system in the 15th trial is affected by the output of the 14th trial, the 10th trial. I, you know, we don't expect that's happening, but the way we set up the random variables, we don't assume that there's this independence going forward. What, the only thing we assume is that um, each trial, the new measurement settings have to be independent from the state of the system. In case again, let's make first assumption again. So when you, for each trial, what is independent of what? So for each trial, yes. um, there's going to be some sort of distribution of what's going to happen. And um, that's, that's independent of the measurement settings that you use to govern. We assume that that's independent of the measurement setting choices for that trial. And that also means that the measurement setting choices have to be independent of previous trials and previous settings choices. So, that means, so you assume the input of the measure, the choice of a measurement basis the independent is it what you're assuming or is it? I, I, so the experiment which, govern, which has perhaps information that governs the outcome probabilities, uh, that has to be independent from the settings coming in. I, I guess I'm saying this a little fuzzy, but uh, the settings are independent. <laughs> yes, uh, what, whatever's making this happen, uh, like ba basically the information, the side information, that has to be independent of the settings choices. And why is this true? We hope it's true. Um, you can never prove definitively that it's not true, but um, if, it, if it weren't true, then you start getting into sort of super determinism arguments because you're basically saying that it's impossible to run an experiment in such a way that the way you choose to measure it 
is always correlated with the experiment you're running it or the system you're measuring. So I'm not sure if you've had time to look at this yet, but how does this compare to the, um, the talk that was presented on Monday on simple and tight bounds for... Um, By a Rotem... Article. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've seen that paper on the archive. Um, so some uh, differences would be they're concerned about quantum side information. And at the moment, we don't know whether our protocol is um, robust to quantum side information. But um, we also constrain the adversary within the experiment to only be no signaling as opposed to bound by quantum mechanics. So that's a weaker assumption on the experiment in the states. And, um, you know, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. We haven't plugged in our numbers to their thing yet. But the, so you don't know if the rates would, like, even which way it would go? Like, if it's bigger or smaller? or As far as rates, um, I would assume, just off the top of my head, that they would be comparable because they have some strong claims about asymptotics. But that's really an asymptotic claim. And so, you know, like I said earlier in the talk, you know, I don't think that my, this new protocol is any better than, you know, Peronio asymptotically. I think they're comparable, but it's, you know, it's, it's really in this finite statistics thing is where we're trying to get a certain number of trials, trying to get it to work. Yeah, so that, that result is also, also works for, for the finite um, block size. Right, but just not well enough for our particular experiment. Okay, so you, you've worked out the rates. Or at least what? Uh, yeah, for Peronio, you would need uh, 100 times as many trials to start getting it to work. Okay. Uh, but I, I don't know what the story is for Rotem are non freedoms. We have not plugged in those numbers. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay, let's thank our speaker again.